Hello, and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on March 28th with Richard K. Miller. He will be giving a presentation on finding records from the time and place your ancestor lived with Goldie May. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner on how I use AI for my own genealogy. Before we begin, here's a little bit about James. James has over 40 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for over 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great grandchildren. And we'll go ahead and turn the time over to James. I'll give you screen sharing. Okay, glad to be online. And we're going to talk today about how I use AI for my own genealogy. So there's going to be a little bit personal here, and it might uh, help you understand that uh, AI is uh, a useful tool, and it's not, not very scary. It's not really scary at all but it does magnify what you do considerably and uh, speeds up a lot of processes in the, in the as you're going along. So we're going to find out today how I use my own genealogy. So let's uh, for use AI for my own genealogy. So let's get right into it. Um, just kind of advising you in in which uh, is becoming quite common that the image in the images in this presentation are generated by either Microsoft Image Generator or Adobe Firefly. However, generating images is not particularly useful for uh, genealogical research. So we won't really talk a lot about images at all. So what you might get out of the news if you've read any articles about uh, artificial intelligence and what's happening out there in the world and on the latest developments which by the way happen almost every day they are mostly ignore genealogy websites i almost never see any reference to any of the genealogy websites in, in ai when interestingly enough those websites have been using AI for over 10 years. So there is no reason why they shouldn't use, uh, be mentioned, but they aren't. And in addition to that, uh, most people are surprised that AI is not something that started just a year ago with uh, what's called generative AI and those images that we're looking at but uh, has been going on for about 50 or 60 or more years. And the recent developments have just caught the news because they uh, are quite a big leap in, in, the, in the use of the technology, but not nearly as completely uh, revolutionary as people would have, you know. They're more evo evolutionary than revolutionary. So, as we go to it, you have to understand that in a real sense, when you use any of the large online genealogy websites, you're using artificial intelligence. Almost from the instant you get on the program. And you may not really understand that because it's not identified as such. You don't have a little sign that comes up and said, using AI. Um, some of the most common ones that you'll probably find are things like ret record matches both Ancestry, MyHeritage, all of the big websites have Find My Past. Uh, um, all of these big websites have generated, they have AI backed record matches. So they're telling you how all these records are related to your family. That's using artificial intelligence to do that. And there've been 
using those for years now, and uh, nobody was claiming that that was going to end the world. But on the other hand, there's some real developments that have uh, occurred recently, as I just mentioned, about uh, searching and looking quickly, you know, getting uh, advanced search techniques. And these are the ones that will benefit us the most over the uh, short run and the long run on genealogy. So let's get into some of the advancements in computer programming that directly benefit genealogical research. And we'll start out with the list. I think the most fundamental advancement that's happened in the last couple of years uh, has been handwriting recognition. For many years, I've been watching the, the development of almost firsthand working with the BYU Family History Technology Lab as they investigated the ways and, write, and been writing programs to uh, recognize handwriting. You may not have been aware, but there was international competition among various companies around the world to see who could be the first to develop the uh, a very reliable and accurate handwriting recognition program. And then to do this, they were, were focusing on some of the worst, let's call it worst handwriting that uh, seems to exist. And that was uh, German black letter handwriting called Faktur. So that's the script that's used. And eventually, about two or so, three years ago, maybe a little bit even before the pandemic, they managed to reach the level of 98% accuracy, which is much higher than any uh, human person can recognize or read that handwriting today. And so this became something that was uh, pretty much well known. So another one is automated OCR, or optical character recognition, transcription, and data extraction. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, and it's been uh, something that has increasingly become more and more uh, uh, sophisticated so that uh, for now, for example, uh, we can extract, uh, transcribe and extract records from photos or off of a, a camera shot. You can take your, with using Google, Translate, for example, you can use your camera, your smart cam uh, smartphone camera and uh, with Google and having the transcription program on there, the translating program, and point it at a sign in a foreign language and have the, the camera instantly translate that into uh, English or any other language. So this is something that's been, been going on for a considerable period of time. DNA analysis and matching, including uh, the uh, genome project where the human genome was um, was described in detail, all came about is because of the very same types of programs they're using today that they call AI programs for analysis and and the DNA matching that you have on your computer that for if you've taken a DNA test with, with um, my heritage or with ancestry, those matches and all of that analysis comes from uh, art uh, artificial intelligence programs. I already mentioned the record matching and the hints. That's another development. Image processing and enhancement. This is uh, going on constantly. I have a subscription to Adobe programs called the Adobe Creative Cloud, and I get updates almost every single day it's from one to eight or 10 updates at a time for all of the Adobe programs. There's just a tremendous amount of, of uh, effort and uh, resources being put into processing and enhancing and identifying images. One of the things that they've talked about as being new are full text data searches. This is where every word in a document is uh, indexed in a sense, where the computer can search word for word through large volumes of, uh, of, of printed material. 
This has also been available for years. There's a large online website called archive.org that presently has over 40 million uh, completely digitized books and readable word for word and searchable word for word. And it didn't happen overnight. That's been going on for years, at least 15 years. The one part that's probably new in the sense of becoming mature and sort of jumping into the to the news was natural language processing applied to large language models. This is where they take hundreds of millions, uh, even billions and billions of records of uh, records that are text records that they can then extract all of the information from and apply a front end that's a natural language processing front end that we now call chat bots or chat and these are the, this is the mechanism by which uh, is being applied generally right now, where you can actually carry on a conversation with the computer and get answers. I use this continually now. I've developed over the last more than a year now that I've been spending uh, considerable time constantly uh, learning about it and, and evaluating and processing things using it. So today, I'm using that constantly to uh, to get more information, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So these advancements have been implemented. By the way, all of these have been implemented by some or all of the large online genealogy database and family tree websites. They're not behind in their development. They're right on the cutting edge of technology, uh, especially the larger websites like Ancestry, Family Search my heritage and find my past. But how many of these are part of the recent news? In other words, what have you been hearing about, about AI all over the news? And which of them would have, uh, are the ones that actually showed up in the last few years? The first one, of course, as I mentioned al already, is handwriting recognition. That's only been a couple of years, but this has been a viable alternative. Right now though, Family Search is using handwriting recognition to uh, to index or transcribe entire documents uh, in handwriting, and then using full text data searches to index the entire document, so that you can search an individual name through millions and millions and millions of pages of records. And this is uh, extremely helpful for documents such as probate files and land record, land and property records, and other records that have a lot of words but not uh, are not very are very difficult to have manually indexed indexes to. The the third area here is image processing and enhancement. I mentioned we're not going to talk a lot about that, but my heritage has been the one that's jump ahead and with this if they're when you can upload photos and have them uh, repaired if they're got folds or tears or scratches and then have them uh, enhanced and clarified and also then colorized and, and turn black and white photos into color photos and then animate the photo and then and even have the people in the photos talk and tell you about their lives. So these is, this is something that's happened just quite recently during the last year or two and uh, is quite impressive. And of course, the last one is the natural language processing applied to large language modules that we're becoming acquainted with as the chat programs. The, the program that is far out and ahead of every of every other company with this is Microsoft and its Copilot program. There are a lot of chat programs out there, but uh, uh, Microsoft has made uh, uh, began the process very early on, and and uh, actually have bought up a lot of the companies or bought into a lot of the companies that uh, have been developing all of these uh, chats and uh, and has way out in front. So that's where we are right now. So just to kind of catch up so that everybody here's on the same page, a chatbot is a computer program that simulates conversation with the human users. So where does the chatbot get its information? If it's Microsoft or Google, 
the chatbot gets its information from their database. So um, it, both those programs have opened up their, their search engines to the chatbots. On Google, it's called Gemini, and on Microsoft, as I've mentioned, it's called Copilot. And those two, you can use them as search engines. So for example, and I'll give you a lot of examples as we go along, that there's uh, a ways that they can you can ask them the same questions that you've been searching for all along on both of those programs using Chrome and Microsoft Edge. And you communicate with these chatbots using questions and suggestions called prompts. So technology always seems to create a lot of, of uh, its own terms. We call that jargon. Uh, a jargon terms are ones that are specific to a specific, to a group of people or, or that interact together. And that the technology is one of the greatest uh, creators of, of uh, program of jargon that, that we've had lately. So I need to keep trying to use AI to solve common research issues. I do this almost constantly. Every time I read about or find any new developments, I just found one today and loaded a new program in to, to evaluate how it works compared to the programs that I've been using. But what I've found as I've gone through this process for a uh, little more than a year now is that they have turned out to be almost spectacularly helpful in solving some of the common research things that I have to do from day to day. So let's get into some of the kind of really interesting things. Now, the first question that might come up with handwriting recognition is, can I use it? Is there some program that I can use to do handwriting recognition? The answer is yes. And then the other part of it is no. Um, it is not yet something that runs on individual computers or even on the internet through an individual computer with any uh, kind of, of accuracy. The problem is that it's one of the one of the greatest, most recent challenges that has uh, faced the computers, because you can imagine all the different styles and all the different ways that, that handwriting was put on a piece of paper or, or some other item. And so recognizing that handwriting has turned out to be turned out to be in a tremendous a challenge. But now that it's been made uh, into something that is extremely accurate and now being used by, as I mentioned, family search to to uh, index millions and millions of records a week, it is uh, a, a viable product, unfortunately. Uh, it still hasn't made its way down to being able to run on on uh, the computers that are of the size that we have here in our uh, in our homes. So if you try it, and that's and I would suggest you keep trying it because you never know. Uh, for example, this written document here uh, uh, was. Uh, just a letter and uh, a will and things like that. And in this case, I put it into uh, what was called BARD at the times, now called uh, uh, Gemini. And Gemini gave me a list of the people who were in the letter, uh, the information that was in the letter, and uh, a lot of other additional information. The good news is they got a lot of information but it's not all real accurate. It, it made some mistakes and then it kind of fills in the blanks with uh, some information that it gathered in other ways. So it's helpful for getting started, but it's also uh, difficult to, um, to really get accurate information with right now. And it may be a step up if you can't read it at all and, the, and it gives you some hints as to the content that may get you started on the on the road to reading the whole document. So the transcription turns out to be kind of a summary of the contents rather than an actual transcription of the of the document. So as AI has developed, 
I'm now using online chat bots, all the AI programs in many, many different ways, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. These are the three that I use the most, uh, Gemini, and then the one symbol there is for Microsoft's Copilot, and then Adobe Firefly. That's the generative program. Now, both Gemini and Chat and uh, Copilot also create images, but the program on, on Microsoft that creates the image is Microsoft's image creator. Um, of the three, I use Microsoft much more than the other programs because uh, their images are, are quite a bit superior to, uh, to the others. And so it's just a matter of working with them and, and branching out and not being focused on one. And if you're not happy with it, just get do the same set of prompts, ask the same questions of, of the different uh, programs. And uh, when you use more than one of the programs and use three or four at a time, then you begin to see the differences in the strengths and the, the weaknesses of each of the programs. So I use them all. And it's not unusual that I'll be using four different websites at the same time and to do one document or one presentation. And I would, I would include that with any just regular searching I've done. I'm always using more than one search engine to find information and comparing it. And I'll soon find out when I do that, which of the one, which of the search engines is able to answer the specific questions that I'm asking for when I'm working on it, things. So almost every week I'm involved in doing consultations for the Salt Lake City Family Search Library. In fact, I just finished one. That's how I got distracted at the beginning of this uh, presentation. I just, uh, I was just, kind of thought out after spending two hours on the line with, with consultations. I must, I usually do, I usually do research with many of the consultations. Most of the questions that they're asking me involve some kind of research. It's not things that I know off the top of my head. They, they are almost always immigration issues. They almost always involve trying to identify the location and the records that come from any particular location around the world, and a lot of other things that are happening. Give me just about one second here. Okay, cut down some of the background noise. So basically what's happening is that um, I can choose to look for links to websites when I let's let's give it a, this kind of a description of a of, of standard search. So I'm looking for uh, a town in um, I'm just going to use one that I know I'm very familiar with Nogales, Sonora, uh, town on the border with Arizona and uh, Mexico. And a lot of almost all of my um, Questions come from people in English, but in about immigration or in Spanish about immigration. And, and the number of Spanish is at least three fourths or two, more than two thirds or more of all of the inquiries that I deal with. So I'm dealing with places like <clears throat> Nogales. And the question is, where do I find the records for Nogales? Okay, well, that can be, that can take a minute. Uh, and basically, if I don't know anything about the town, which I know a little bit, but not these kinds of things, I don't instantly know where the records are located. And because they're usually either civil registration or, or parish registers for the towns that are that I'm dealing with, and sometimes the towns are just tiny little mountain towns in the mountains in Ecuador and Colombia and the places, different places around Latin America. Sometimes in Spain, sometimes in Italy, sometimes in all the rest of parts of Europe. So the key is, without knowing the town, you can't really find any records. So we, so I ask questions about where these people came from. When I have the the town, like 
people who say they're from Nogales, then I need to know how to find the records. Well, I can go into Family Search and use the catalog and look through and see if I can find some records from Nogales. And, and, and sometimes I can. But on a lot of little towns, there's nothing in the town that tells me the parish, I mean, nothing in Family Search or any of the other uh, rec or databases that tell me which, which place I'm looking for. So now I can go to um, the chatbots and the particular one that's the most helpful, as I mentioned, is Microsoft. At the present time, it's Microsoft Copilot. So how does that work? Well, so as I do the presentations, one other thing that I've got to do is look up a lot of the images. I'll just get to answering all these questions at once. And uh, so mostly now I use generated in images rather than any of the images online that I, I have to search through because I can spend a great deal of time searching for images. And I can really go in right in directly to um, one of the three or four different image generating programs that I've that I use, which include, as I mentioned, Adobe Firefly, um, Microsoft Image Creator, um, Google, uh, Gemini, um, Adobe. Oh, that's a Firefly. Um, and the, there was one or two others. But when I go into those programs, I simply have to type in a description, a short description of what I'm looking for. And then I get the images that I, I have on my presentations. That saves me probably hours of work on each of the presentations that I do. It's work that was productive because I was finding images but it took so much time that it was really not productive to spend that much time. So here's a sample. I'm going to start to give some samples of what's going on with genealogy and AI. Now, I've posited some questions there. I have to find places for all of these consultations that I schedule about eight a week to do. I have a lot of information that I need for my presentations, including images. So this is the this is the issue that I'm standing up against. So let's see what's happened. First of all, we have FamilySearch.org Labs. That came out at Roots Tech just a couple of weeks ago from the date of this presentation, and there'll be another one next year in 2025. And uh, and as far as we know, and all of the next years after that. So basically, we learned that there were some AI programs that had been um, developed now for use by individuals uh, using Family Search. So first of all, they have expanded their search from their from their usual. Um, if you've done any indexing for Family Search, you know that they give you some a limited number of fields to index names, dates, places, things like that. Now they do full text indexing. So now they're they're taking handwriting recognition to to uh, put the, the handwritten parish registers and other documents into text. And then they're using full text searches to search every word and, and allow searches on every single word in a document. Of course, you don't want to search for the small words like the and and whatever. You search for names and places and, and information that might be unique. But also, there's another part of that, and that's to using directly using AI to do the search. So you can ask natural language questions. Now, unfortunately, in the last couple of days, uh, the AI search does not seem to be responding to prompts. So it's uh, still up there on familysearch.org forward slash labs. But uh, it's not working at the moment, but I assume it'll come back online uh, whenever they continue to work on it. And some of these pro programs are, are changing daily, as I've mentioned. And so this is not, a, not an exception. 
But here's a, a way that what happens with it is instead of doing indexing, where you're the one that's uh, trying to read the handwriting, you are basically can work at correcting or reviewing the handwriting that's already been read, been uh, transcribed by the AI program on Family Search. So now, if you go to Family Search, get involved then you can help with this review process. And that's, by the way, much more efficient than doing indexing. You can review probably 100 documents when you were trying to read maybe 10 or 15. So whatever, what else happens? When I'm working with familysearch.org, I can find AI, I can find a deeds and lands. Right now it's deeds, land, and uh, land and property records, um, and then probate records. So I can find deeds in a pro in in the land and property records on Family Search. In this case, I looked for one of my ancestors, Henry Martin Tanner, and it came up with H. M. Tanner and all the other variations on his name and his wife. And here was uh, a deed that I had never seen previously. The one on the left there. Uh, I don't think anybody had ever found it. There's no way that somebody would have just kind of thought about going to look for a deed in this particular date and not and without spending every day looking through the, the land and property records, uh, which are usually ordered ordered chronologically rather than, than having an index. Sometimes there are index and sometimes it's useful. But in this case, we didn't even suspect that the deeds existed. And this was a, uh, a, a, a deed that I found, fortunately, by searching on the on the uh, Family Search AI search. And I'm sure there's a lot more, and I'm anxious to get back into the program and uh, do some more searches for more deeds and records. Um, one of the things that happened with that uh, with the search, uh, the AI search, was that Family Search. Uh, partnered with uh, American ancestors with the New England Historic Gene Genealogical Society and a project called 10 Million Names Project, and that's to find all the enslaved people who came to America. And a lot of those people are embedded in, in probate records and plantation records. And these records are going to be part of what uh, the first records that the Family Search AI will search and they've already done some test cases and, and worked with people, volunteers for on the project of 10 Million Names Project. And they are finding uh, people that have never been found or never been able to be found previously because there's just too much work involved. And it's it just is very difficult to go through uh, hundreds of not thousands of pages of records and not, and not and be able to find an, an individual name. And that's what's happening now with the AI. The same thing is happening here on MyHeritage with their AI record finder program. They're able to search the records that are already on MyHeritage in a way that makes it uh, uh, basically asking questions by saying, I'm looking for this person, I'm looking for, um, uh, Richard DeFries uh, on the on the website, and they're coming up with the searches that they are. Um, the The advantage here is that rather than getting a list of sources, you're getting a list. You're getting answers. You're getting actual answers to the records that are being requested. Additionally, there's another one, and this is another possibility with with uh, the new AI developments is you could ask them to do a biography of uh, someone on MyHeritage. They have a, a feature called AI Biographer. And as I did that, and I asked about my um, uh, grandfather, um, I asked uh, them to just do a, a, and like two minutes later, I had what was on the right-hand side, that uh, five-page, document there 
of, of his biography and history and historical context and the name of the origin of the name and everything with photos and everything taken. All of this information was gathered from the, from the uh, My Heritage uh, website. So this is, uh, and it's just incredible. Um, even if I had, if I had thought about sitting down and doing this, uh, it would have taken me many, many hours of work to put this all together, and even using the My Heritage website. But doing this in a matter of a few minutes is is incredible. Of course, you need to read few it, review it, and but you'll notice here that um, if you look closely at the text, that there's numbers after every. Uh, every part of the image and that is telling you there are sources out there and where the sources were obtained so this is uh this is a way now another thing in looking at ancestry the uh the record was uh is a little bit different the first thing they did was they're using handwriting recognition and uh the ai uh, analysis to index the entire 1940, 1950 census. The 1940 census took about six months to begin to get the basic index. The basic index for the 1950 census was done, done overnight in about six hours plus one day. And then the checking took about three or four months more. But uh, a lot of the websites are still trying to compile their indexes to the 1950 census. So this is uh, this was a remarkable achievement. Now you may not see it sort of blatantly put out as AI, but you see on this this portion of my family tree on uh, on ancestry, you see all the green outlines there, and those green outlines are AI generated. Uh, suggestions that they've located the next generation of people uh, for uh, that you can find on uh, on the website and this may be breakthroughs on some of the lines that you've been just waiting on in this particular case all of these names would have to be verified and to see that they were correct but in each case there are records that are gathered by ancestry to support that you see all the little green leaves that are out there they're telling you that there's more records that show that they're who their parents are and i found them to be very close to almost uh, uniformly correct so it's just a very interesting and very enabling way to work with uh, with the genealogy. Okay, so we have my two questions that are still floating out there. The first question was, how do I find all of these records and do the research for these uh, immigrant ancestors that I'm uh, uh, researching each week? And how do I solve some of the other problems that I have out there about researching on my presentations? So now we're here, and this is Microsoft Copilot. And one of, the, one of the biggest challenges, as I just described to you, is finding the parish. You have the name of the town, but that doesn't give you the name of the parish in the Catholic Church to help you find these records. And so I've been, uh, and I've developed ways over the last couple of years as I've been doing these uh, constant stream of, of uh, immigration questions, to try and find the parishes using Catholic directories and other kinds of things online. But here, and using uh, Copilot now for the last couple of months, as I've discovered, I can simply ask, and you can see what I wrote to Copilot there at this top. I said, tell me the Catholic parish for the town of Vigia Nueva de Pardillo in Madrid, Spain. So, instead of looking up the town, instead of getting a list of sort of possible sources that might give me the answer, it answers the questions. And it says in Vigia Nueva del Pardillo, you can find the Parroquia San Lucas Evangelista. There's the parish, Parroquia is parish. 
and there's the address and there's the information about that place and um basically in a matter of a few seconds and saving me literally hours and hours of searching when i have three or four of those questions to answer in the, in one week i could spend three or four hours of my time uh, trying to find the parishes and that's the key to finding these records because even if i know uh, the place sometimes that place never shows up in family search and i need the parish and then the parish may show up but on the lists of the catholic church records and in, in family search the churches are listed and those are the parishes and and so there's a match there and we're able to find the records quite easily that way by typing in the question and i just did that today for one of the one of the consultations that i was working on right before this class so this is an amazing way to do it so i can find the spanish parishes and churches and other things around the world and so i just have to sit down and ask a question instead of getting this long list of of links to websites that just seem to drag on and on and on forever so here's another one Let's say I have this question that came up and it says that they're looking for uh, an ancestor whose name was Darocha. And uh, we weren't sure which language or where it was. And I just asked the question of Microsoft Copilot. And it tells me there are the, the variations in the name and tells me what the German name might be. And then a, some of the other information about that there's other places out there obviously and if you notice at the bottom of each of these pages there's some uh, blue markings down there your ancestry uh, microsoft gives me immediately uh, a list of the pair of the sources of all this information so the question that comes up is how accurate are they and the answer here is it's very accurate and not only is it very accurate but it is uh, footnoted. And if you wanna know where it came from, you just click on those footnotes and it'll come in and explain to you exactly where all of those names came from. So now I'm able to find alternative names and spellings without having to find a word list that happens to have that particular name on it, which by the way, can take uh, a considerable amount of time searching through name lists. Because if I ask for a name, for the origin of a name, it'll it, on a regular uh, Google search, for example, it will just give me a list of websites that have name lists. And so that is the problem. Now, here's another big challenge out there. And this challenge is that um, the question is, how in the world are you going to read through this will and make out all of the all of the relationships and what each person gets, and all they're called the the testator, the person who made the will or testatrix, and uh, all the all of the um, people named to receive the the property from the will. They're the um, where each of the the people it named in the will. So this is something called doing an abstract of the will. It's it's a, a standard practice, and they have abstracts online where people have recorded this for wills. But a lot of times you'll run across a will that's been transcribed, but you'll find no abstract. And so you can spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out all this information. Or you can ask Gemini, and they'll give you a list of the names of the devisees, the disposition of the property, the gifts and bequests, and the relationships of the parties and the witnesses. So this will all happen in about 10 seconds. So what has it done to the questions that I've, I, and the problems that I have? Basically, instead of spending a lot of time asking for searches on Google and getting lists of websites and then having to go to the, each of the websites to see if they have the information that i need 
in in essence, what I'm doing is getting answers immediately. I'm getting the straight, I'm getting an answer that I can verify within a few minutes by looking at sources. And if, if for instance, on Gemini, if uh, I want to know where they got the information, in this case, obviously, they got it from the will. But if there was other information that they provided and you have any doubt at all that it's not correct, then you can ask Gemini to give you this list of all the citations of the places where they looked for the information. Now, they learned to do this um, after people began saying that they were unreliable. So then instead of, of uh, uh, being uh, defensive, they simply fixed it and added the, the uh, footnote errors. So now all the questions that I had and the difficulties that I had initially and I outlined have been uh, been relatively solved by the the um, programs these chatbot programs so what if I want to translate something well this is a Hungarian oh no it's a Swedish document this one's in Swedish and uh, I sort of read Swedish but it'd be nice to have the translations of the headings so that I'm not missing anything well, I could sit down and I could either go look for a Swedish word list, genealogical word list, and maybe work out word by word all of the information that's in the heading. Or I could just pull out a Swedish dictionary, or I could try to find somebody online that had already translated these headings and come up with the headings. And perhaps I've already done that and I already know all the headings. But if I hadn't done that, which is the case here, then how can I do this? Well, I can take that document and, and I can take a screenshot of the heading. So I do a screenshot of the headings and there's the heading in Swedish. And then I just simply drop that into the Google uh, Translate program. Go to Google Translate at translate, uh, translate.google.com and there's now a button that says add an image so then you click and drop your image in and a few seconds later there's the translation of everything in the heading so any language in any program there's over 100 languages on google you could drop that heading in from and do research directly on those people. Now, after that, there's going to be a lot of, of handwritten information there. But uh, the interesting thing is that in some cases, that handwriting recognition is also, is also recognized by, by Google Translate. So here's, the, here's a, a solution to doing research in, other, in these languages. And if you found a, a record uh, and you need all of the typewritten text written portion of it's translated you can get that translated so here's another part of that that i mentioned earlier and that is you can use a smartphone to uh, look at something on the page in this case the same uh, record in uh, swedish and then i can uh, with the camera going and if you have chrome and if you have the translate uh, activate it on your phone. It will simply flip over as soon as you it focuses on the the on the text. Then it'll have a little check in the lower right hand corner that you you a button you push, and it trans uh, gives you the option to translate. You you hit translate, and the words appear on your phone uh, translating this the the um, text immediately you know, right there and visually while you're looking at it. So you could actually be traveling around in a country like Sweden or Germany or whatever. It was if it was a place you did not read the handwriting or I mean the signs and just use your phone to post it a sign. My daughter, who uh, spends a lot of time in Hungary, um, says that this is how she goes shopping in Hungary because she can go into the supermarkets and take out her phone and translate all of the the uh, names of all the products and all and knows what they're what she's trying to buy 
and also can tell the prices. So it's uh, quite an interesting way to get going on this. So if you're sitting in your computer and you run across some text in a document you can't read, as long as it's printed text at this point, but you'll understand if you look at this carefully, you'll see that um, the record underneath the, the uh, transcribed actually transcribed some of the handwritten uh, information that was on here. And I see this handwriting recognition coming very rapidly to uh, computers, our own home computers and uh, smartphones. So here's kind of a blow up to show you what kind of information came out of that. and also that some of the handwriting could be can translated. So basically you get translations, I mean, you get answers instead of lists. So the same question to Wikipedia, to um, Google search on the left, and what you get the same question about the different political and jurisdictional, judicial ju uh, jurisdictions in Sweden. And the, the prompt was, what are the different jurisdictions in Sweden? And here it tells you the whole question. Otherwise, you have to spend some considerable time trying to figure that out from the, from the um, record. And also, remember to note the footnotes down there. That gives you links to all the information where this um, places where all this information came from. If I wanted to know the probate files, now you can understand that both Gemini and Copilot search family search website. You may not, you may have difficulty using the catalog, the catalog or, or searches on family search, but you can always search for the information you need on Google and Gem and on Copilot and Gemini. And if you get both of those, you can see they list all the all the different records. But the advantage is, and what isn't shown here, is that there are links to all the records there. And I tried uh, Gemini with a different prompt, and it still gave me a list of the records, but not, uh, not, not so many of the links. So I can ask it for source citations, and then it will give me that information. But uh, it's a two-step process. So and I think that'll probably change. So here's what happened when I asked for the for these the links. And Copilot will also analyze the documents and select out exactly what I need with the links and the sources. And that's a good reason for using more than one chatbot. Chat GPT, on the other hand, one that everybody talks about doesn't give me any information at all. It just tells me how to go to the website and search. And it doesn't even actually, it's not even actually accurate on when it searches. So keep learning, keep experimenting because all of this information is going to be made available. And thanks for watching. So do we have any questions today? It says in my heritage, if you were not in the biography, if you're not familiar with the person, how would you check the results? Because all of those results are linked to the documents that they got the information from. They're just from documents. So the question would not be, is the biography correct? But the question would be, is the information about the person in, in my heritage correct? And that would be only available if you were spending the time to make sure that's correct. I wouldn't be asking for biographies for people that I wasn't sure about some basic information so that I would know who I was talking about. Um, I've done already done a couple of the, of, I'll be doing a constant number of, of um, presentations on AI over the next year, probably even up to and including Roots Tech next year. Had a good success this year at Roots Tech with a class three class, three part class. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded, but we'll be recording it at on uh, for uh, the BYU uh, YouTube channel. Anything else? We have some questions. Um, are the site subscription costs and what AI programs are available to the common genealogists and are they affordable? Those kind of group um, together. 
Oh, that was something I should have said at the beginning. Um, and that is that Copilot and Gemini are both free. Uh, there are what are called enterprise versions of both programs, but they're re very expensive. They are into the hundreds of dollars a year. And uh, they're not really an advantage unless you are an enterprise user, which means you work with a company that has um, that uses Microsoft products uh, as part of your work. Uh, then you have an expanded version of both um, the Google and, and uh, Microsoft's. There's news today that Apple has uh, partnered with Google now to provide information to the smartphones through uh, through from Google. So we'll see how that develops. That was something that just happened in the last day or two. Yeah, and they're free. There's no charge for it. There's also a free G, uh, chat GPT portion, but uh, one that has all of the fancy stuff is really a, is like $20 a month. There's others that are free, like Adobe Firefly, Firefly is not free. It's part of the of the creative cloud and there's a, a you need to subscribe to that. And I just, I use all the creative cloud programs so that uh, Adobe Firefly is included. So it isn't an, any extra cost to me, but it's pretty expensive, hundreds of dollars a year to be in, to have all the Adobe programs. The reason is that we use those, my wife and I both use all those Adobe programs every almost every day in our work, um, doing not only our genealogy, but all the companies that my wife is running. Any other questions? Um, okay, Kathy well. asks, I've never seen an ancestry, the people hints you had, just the leaves. Do you have to turn something on to see those? Say again. Um, she's asking about the people hints on ancestry and if she has to turn in turn on something to see those. Um, I'm not sure where they come from. I didn't turn on anything and I didn't add anything. So I'm not sure how I got them. They just started showing up and I don't know where they're coming from. Okay. So I don't know if there's something you need to do, but um they have or if it's available to all the users or whatever. So it's uh, of what level, I don't know, but they've just shown up on my computer. So it's, you know, sometimes I can't even figure out why their things have shown up, but they do. Okay. Okay, we have one last question, if you're okay with that. Sure. Sigrid says, how would you search for someone's maiden name? Say again. How would you search for someone's maiden name? Maiden name? Yeah. Um. I would say, do you know the maiden name of, <laughs> and give some information about the person, the, you know, Mary Smith born in uh, such and such a date in such and such a place and died in such a place and her husband's name was this and see if the program knows the maiden name. That would be an interesting um, experiment to do. Sorry, I haven't asked that, but I would, I, you can, you can, Count on the fact that I will have tried that now in the next few days <laughs> to see if it can happen to ones that I don't know the, the answer to. All right, perfect. It looks like we don't have any other questions. Thank you. So we can go ahead and close. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on March 28th with Richard K. Miller. You will be giving a presentation on finding records from the time and place your ancestor lived with Goldie May. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fh underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.